right, welcome back to another edition of the podcast. So today with me, I have Ty Cats play-by-play, radio play-by-play, Marshall Ferguson on the line. Marshall, before we start the interview, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm good. I'm, I'm holding up, I guess, as well as you possibly can, considering everything we're going through. I, I have a feeling that uh, as of the next couple of days, it's going to sink in that the CFL season isn't going to be going down as I'm used to. So that'll, I think that'll rattle the chain a little bit, and it'll feel a little strange. But for right now, I've been making it okay the last two months or so. So to start off, uh, what made you interested in going to sports journalism? Uh, you know, I, I actually, it's funny looking back because when I was in early high school, I would say I kind of, I had a love for consuming sports media, whether that was reading Slam Magazine or watching, you know, sports shows that were talking about the games that I loved and breaking down the athletes and things like that. But I never really truly had an interest. Um, at least I didn't realize that I should have had an interest relatively early on. So, so I think a lot of people, you know, they have that passion and they, they want to get into it. And it's because um, you feel the drive towards it. I felt the drive to consume media before I ever felt the drive to produce it. And I think that's kind of helped me because I never really considered myself somebody who was uh, tasked with the idea of needing to produce. I just kind of organically came about it. So I actually went through university was planning on working in political science, whether that was being a speechwriter, which was something I was interested in for politicians or uh, working in the House of Commons in some way, shape or form. I, I wasn't sure if I ever wanted to really be a politician because that didn't really seem my alley, but the world of politics always intrigued me, which is why I wanted to study it when I was at McMaster University. So um, I went through all of that and by about my third year or so, I started doing a lot of interviews and I enjoyed being able to talk to people and I enjoyed the kind of the, the dance and the through the hula hoop that we all do when you're on during a show and interviewing guests. And, uh, and that kind of gave me the bug a little bit. And then I started watching great shows like Tim and Sid and seeing, you know, I, I think it was really interesting to start to see more and more radio shows that were on TV because you really just got to study um, what those guys were doing and why they were so good at what they were doing and the nonverbal communication between each other. So I started kind of studying that a little bit and, uh, and, and began loving kind of the way that we discuss sports more and more. And that was when I really figured out, I would say relatively late in my, my sports playing life, that that might be something that would be a good path for me. Uh, talking about university, uh, did you play any sports at McMaster? Yeah, yeah, I played football, so I was there, uh, played quarterback for them. I was there full five years. It was uh, 2010 was my first year through 2014. So uh, we went to three Vanier Cups. We only won the one back in 2011, but uh, it was it was something that definitely influenced my perspective on sports because there's nothing like being inside a locker room to really truly understand what the dynamic of a team is. Uh, and it gave me a great appreciation for the fact that all the sports broadcasters that you see that are saying, well, this is what it's like inside that room. Unless you're in that room, we don't know. None of us know. And uh, once I realized that, I think it gave me more of a human perspective. But that's, that's because I used to see people that would say things about our locker room and they had no damn clue what they were talking about. And so now I'm on the other side of things, right, where I'm the one who's talking about a locker room and you kind of learn. So uh, it definitely it kind of shapes the way that you look at the team dynamic. And, and playing helped me kind of understand the work that goes into being great too, because there were a lot of guys around me that uh, went on to be CFL players and, and all-stars and different things. And, and they really put the work in, in a way that you could tell the difference between what it takes to be a player that survives, a player that's really good, or a player that's great and has a chance to play professionally. And, uh, and that was, I think, probably the biggest eye-opener for me at that level, because I'd never been around professional athletes at that point. What were your feelings like when you have won the Vanier Cup? Uh, crazy, crazy. I remember I was, my favorite memory of it, you know, all this stuff I love so much because it just, it just happens, right? Like you don't force it. It's just a memory that's stuck with you forever. I actually, the way the game unfolded for those that haven't seen the 2011 Vanier is we end up, uh, you know, trying to be able to win the game in regulation. It goes to overtime, then it goes to double OT and then we're kicking the winning field goal. When, when the first field goal was supposed to go through, uh, in regulation, I was down on a knee, linked arms with our starting quarterback at the time, Kyle Quinlan, and super you know, excited, ready to burst onto the field. And of course, it doesn't end up going in. And because it doesn't end up going in, we go to overtime and we're like, okay, we still got a life and everybody kind of has to regroup and get themselves prepared for overtime. In double overtime, I remember thinking, okay, now we really got it. Like we got the field goal for the win and being down on a knee 
and looking around and going, where's, where's Quinlan? Where's our starting quarterback? Because I was with him, and we wanted to have that moment together at the end of regulation when we were supposed to win originally. And I turn around, and, and Kyle was walking away from the field, and he was walking towards his mom. Uh, who means everything to him, who was sitting in the crowd. He was going to celebrate with her. But I couldn't believe, Michael, that he wasn't going to watch the field goal go in. Like, if you're going to end your career with a double overtime national championship winning field goal, don't you want to see it with your eyes at least once? Like, there's only one time. You're going to watch it on video for the rest of your life. So I remember getting up and actually running away from the direction of the field goal, turning the other way and screaming, Kyle, Kyle you got to see it, man. I'm like, I'm like, you got to look at it with your own eyes kind of thing. And he just shrugged me off. And as I'm running, I realize, oh, bleep, I'm going to miss it. So I turn around and I literally see the kick go through the uprights as I'm away from all my teammates. And I pull a 180 and just looped out to center field completely by myself and lost my mind. Like was no helmet on, fist pumping, down on my knees, punching the turf as hard as I possibly could. Uh, I would love to see like the wide shot of the reaction at BC Place in Vancouver because it was like an out-of-body experience. It's one of the coolest things I've ever felt. And we all got, you know, McMaster tattoos and things to remember it by. And I've had some people before that have been like, you know, do you, are you going to regret that? Like if you end up coaching at a different university or if you're a broadcaster for a long time, you talk to people from Laurier and Western. I'm like, no, because nothing takes away from what we did. And every time I look at my McMaster tattoo, all I can think about is me running out to midfield like a crazy person and fist pumping and punching the turf and losing my mind. So uh, it's definitely one of the coolest things. It, it's easily the biggest win I've ever had in my life. It's definitely the coolest feeling I think I've ever had, just knowing that you win the final game of uh, your season because there's nothing like that. And it's I've experienced it a couple times in high school and different football leagues, but um, to do it at that level against that opponent, which was Laval, was, it's the coolest thing that we've ever accomplished. And Laval's a good university for football, correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they they came about relatively late. Like, they're not one of those teams that's been around since the 1950s or 60s. They're, I think they were kind of near the end of uh, the millennium. They were 96, I want to say, off the top of my head. And, and they've developed rapidly into just this monster. So um, they're a perennial power, and they just they beat the hell out of us the following year in 2012 in the Vanier rematch at the Sky Dome. So, um, and then since then, they've won it like two, maybe three more times, I think. And uh, so yeah, they to beat them and and to do it on a national stage was pretty amazing. You so like you said, you lost the Vanier Cup the next year. Uh, did you was that heartbreaking for you since you won the year prior? Yeah, it was. Twenty twelve was a funny one because um, we were just dazed the entire game. Like it was as much as twenty eleven was an out of body experience being able to win it. Twenty twelve was an out of body experience because I was still a backup quarterback at that point, and I remember walking up and down the sideline in the, the second half and there's, there was always a belief in our team because we had so many great players that had dug a set of holes before but um, there were so many times where I would like look up at the Skydome scoreboard and see that we're down by 15 or 20 points whatever it was and you just like shake your head you're like how the hell are how, first of all how are we losing and second of all how are we losing by this much because you look at the sideline it's like we got Matt Sewell who's going to the Tennessee Titans Kyle Quinley who's one of the greatest quarterbacks in CISU sports history uh, Brad Fochas, I was a great receiver. Mike DeCroce is the fastest guy in youth sports. Ben O'Connor is a great possession guy. We got three offensive line. We got two pass rushers going to the CFL. We got like OUA All-Stars up and down. And we're just looking around at each other on the sideline going like, this ain't how it's supposed to end. This is, this is the worst thing that we've been through. So um, it was a lot of, uh, I think, soul searching in the second half. But while we were soul searching, Laval was just executing. And just they played so well that game. We couldn't stop their ground game. We couldn't throw the ball around the way we wanted to, the way we had the year before in the 2011 Vanier. So, um, yeah, it was it was the the greatest, I think, kind of realization of how special it was to be able to get to a Vanier in 2011. Because I'm in my second year of university in 2011. Like, I'm just a kid at that point, and I didn't really, you know, understand the, gra the gravity of the moment. And then 2012 hits, and we get slapped around like that. And you're like, that might be the last time I'm ever in a Vanier. And then 2013 comes, and we don't even make it to the Yates Cup. And then 2014, we battle our way all the way back to the Vanier Cup, and we end up losing on a last-second field goal against Montreal in Montreal as well. So, you know, two, two Vanier Cups that were super, super memorable, and one that year in 2012 that was just an absolute just mind-bender to try and figure out how we had possibly gotten ourselves into that battle spot. 
did you guys have to deal with any of the like were you guys cocky at all is that why you guys just uh, fell flat no, I think they were just really, really well coached. They had a great game plan. They were running this little, like, outside stretch zone type running play that we had a really hard time containing with our defensive ends. And uh, they just basically out-muscled us at the point of attack on defense. And then offensively, uh, basically, I mean, they they really try to make you take the most difficult throws on the field. And Kyle, our starting quarterback, Quinlan, was in the, the game against the University of Calgary the week before the national semifinal. He had taken a shot with a helmet on his quad I don't know how it didn't break his femur, uh, and not many people know, but he didn't he didn't practice uh, much that week. Like he barely moved around. He had a compression pad on it, which is basically like a, a foam piece that's strapped to your leg to try and reduce swelling by constantly having pressure on a bruise. But he would take that compression pad off, and his whole leg was black and blue. blue. So um, even the day before the game, I think I I basically took all the first team reps at practice because he couldn't move around, he couldn't throw, so he was basically just tossing the ball around on the side. But uh, he was uh, he was pretty banged up, and we were not in as good a shape as we were in 2011 overall as a team athletically at that point. So uh, it was just just the way things go. Again, the, my job now covering sports, you know, we like to make up storylines and we like to say, well, you know, this team came into the game this way or that way. In reality, sometimes there's just a better team, and Laval was absolutely a better team. We were well prepared. We were as as well coached a team as you can imagine. We were in the right place mentally, and they were just really damn good. And that's I hate to simplify it like that, but that was when I left the game that night. I remember sitting on the team bus and thinking to myself, "Wow, man, that was a crazy couple of years. I can't believe we went to back to back venues." And I'm like, "How the hell did we lose by that much?" I'm just like, "They're really good." Like that. That's why. That's you came to realize very quickly that that was just that they were they were more prepared than we were at that point. You hung up your cleats after five years with McMaster. Then you started out with TSN. Uh, tell me how you got to TSN. I got uh, basically I was doing a community radio show at CFMU ninety three three in uh, McMaster's basement, and I got a call. Um, it's it's so funny to look back because I was essentially creating my own YouTube. Uh, you know, podcast kind of thing, but I was doing it in a way that I was trying to make it look like television. Like I was trying to make the quality of it look good enough that people would want to see it. So, you know, I've got a, a Sony handy cam on a tripod perched real high up in the corner of the room that makes it look like I'm doing a Tim and Sid show. And I've got my own graphics that I've created in Photoshop and I'm slicing them in and all this stuff. And I got a call from uh, Bob Harris, who at that time was kind of the managing director of Bell Media, Niagara St. Catharines. And he said, can you, just come in and have a conversation with me. And I said, sure. And I didn't think it was really about a job or anything. And it turns out I go in and at that point, TSN radio didn't exist. And he said, uh, you know, we've, we're doing something here. We're not sure it's going to come to fruition. There's still some talks happening, but if it does, we'd like to have you on board. And I said, okay, sounds good. And I said, I have absolutely no clue what the job is, but apparently I have a job that isn't, you know, serving at Boston pizza if I end up getting it. So uh, but three months later, he called me and said, hey, TSN's putting a radio station in Hamilton. We're transitioning the signal, uh, and we want to make you the first hire. So that was how I ended up being able to uh, to get involved uh, with the radio station. And it basically just evolved from there, from being, you know, afternoon sports centers to when we actually opened up our lineup. I was hosting the afternoon drive show. Uh, I was calling McMaster football games my first year at the station in 2015. And then I called Ticats games beginning in 2016. So I've uh, been doing Ticats games now for 16, 17, 18, and 19. And I've uh, been kind of going from there. But that was how I got my foot in the door was just basically working hard, doing the groundwork, and, and getting a call from somebody who had noticed somehow, I don't know how, um, that, uh, that there was something worth developing there. And I'm thankful that they saw it because I didn't even see it. I was just doing that stuff for fun on the side because I was just a bored college kid who was trying to figure out what I wanted to do after I was done serving beers every night down at Boston Pizza. But um, for them to be able to see it and, and allow it to kind of come to fruition, I thought was, uh, it changed my life. Certainly it took me in a different direction, which I've enjoyed a lot. That must have uh, felt very special for you to be like one of the first people on Hamilton uh, TSN radio. Yeah, I, the thing that, um, you know, as you get older, you have a little bit more appreciation for history, I think, and talking to people who have lived in and around Hamilton, the idea that, so our signal, CKOC 1150 AM, it's been a variety of different things because there's always different formats that radio stations will take on, but signal has been around for damn near a century and it's never been sports, but Hamilton's such a great sports city that 
the idea of being the first, I always joke with my boss, Mike Neighbors, who's the best boss in the world, so understanding, such a great guy to talk with about anything. I always joke with him that I'm the first employee of TSN 1150 Hamilton, and he told me I will be the last. He says, when we shut the doors, uh, it's like, you know, it doesn't matter if you're 60 years old or if you're 20, 29, you know, next year, something like that. He says, you'll be the last guy we have here because you're the one that we trust and that we had here from the beginning. So the coolest thing I did just kind of historically, I think that I'll always remember as long as I'm involved in this industry and maybe longer is um, when we actually flipped the switch to go from being CKOC 1150 oldies, which was just, you know, the old Beals and things like that to being TSN. I was the first voice that had the privilege of being able to be on the station. And that was really, really cool because I had basically written up a, a bit of a, like a two minute monologue about the gravity of the moment and Hamilton being a sports city and deserving the right sports that would let to be able to let their fandom come to life. And I want to be the voice of that and all that stuff. So I'm, I'd love to hear that. Uh, I mean, it's long, long, long gone. That would have been Labor Day of 2015, right at 9am uh, when we flipped the switch and I gave that. But uh, yeah, that was, that was a really cool moment to be able to kind of be the first on all of that. Cause it is, it's a, it's a privilege because there's a lot of people that care a lot about sports in town. Like you said, you were calling Ty Cats games for about uh, four or five years now. How breathtaking is it to watch uh, Brandon Banks return a kick? Yeah, Speedy's, it's cool because I get to see these guys home and away and at practice every day, right? So it's uh, the thing that I enjoy, I think, is, is that you can see, you can really tell when you're around a team and when you cover a team daily uh, when they're on and when they're not. And you can see the sheer speed that a Brandon Banks has because I've seen everybody in the league live. I've seen all the best receivers live for four years. I've seen, uh, you know, the best quarterbacks make the best throws live and in person. They just, they do some things that just take your breath away. It's incredible. So um, there's, there's something special about a lot of these guys that, uh, that you just can't coach and that's why they become where they're at. But for me, there's certain moments that stick out, you know, whether it's a Masoli throw off his back foot or a Jalen Saunders route to break open from coverage or a big Simone Lawrence tackle where he comes out of nowhere and makes the play. Um, you see it live and yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty, I wish our broadcast booth wasn't so damn high up in Tim Hortons Field, I'll tell you that because I'd have more appreciation for it if we were down closer to the action, but unfortunately we're like 15 stories up there. I think when the Lancaster flies over on Labor Day, I and give a high five to the pilot if I want because we're all the way up there but it's uh it's pretty amazing to see them do what they do for a living and, and what they care about so much in person uh like you said uh you know you were part of calling this season's past great cup between the blue bombers and the tie cats uh, how surprised were you on how flat the tie cats played after showing such a dominant season yeah it was it was a tough one the I was actually doing the national sidelines for that one so um I was actually on the tie cat sideline and that that flatness is the right word to use because it was there was just no chatter and it was it was hard to tell for me because I'm always in the booth whether or not that was normal or if that was them being down early and not being able to recover but I think they saw what was coming like I was on the sidelines with Shinetti and as I'm talking to him um uh, he's basically just saying to me like they're dead um I'm looking at him I'm like yeah and it's like the first quarter we're just looked at each other we're like they don't have any answers like this is this isn't gonna get any better and it's not it didn't feel like an X's and O's thing it felt like you know maybe they could have done a better job on Willie Jefferson the game plan or maybe they could have converted on those fourth downs and or third downs I should say and being able to move the football a little bit on through the air on first down a little bit better and it's like okay that's fine but like the energy man it was it was a weird weird vibe on the sideline and then, of course, Speedy gets hurt, and then you end up having Mike Jones go down, and now you're playing guys that don't play in their normal position, and then you end up having pass rushers go down, and Dylan Wynn gets dinged before halftime. It's like I've never seen so many injuries in a game, and it just felt like it was a repetitive kick to the stomach every time an important guy would go down because you'd look at the roster and you'd be like, okay, who's, who is supposed to go in? It's not, about, <laughs> like, it's not about whether or not we have trust in the guy. It's trying to figure out who is actually healthy enough to even play because the roster is not huge in the CFL on game day. So um, I felt for those guys that night. I really did because it was a great championship for Winnipeg and they earned it. But there's a lot of moments in that game where I, I've been beaten in championship games, as I mentioned, whether it's the 12 Vanier, the 14 Vanier, my final game in high school was a city championship game where it felt very similar where the sidelines just quiet. Dudes are getting injured all over the place. You can't uh, complete the passes that you want to. You can't protect the quarterback the way you have all year. 
And when that happens, you're bound to get beat down in a really important moment. And they did. Dane Evans was a rookie in that game in his first Grey Cup. And Zach Kalaros obviously played uh, in a different Grey Cup. Do you think experience trumped, uh, you know, the rookie Dane Evans? Yeah, I see, I know Dane pretty well from being around him. And I don't think the moment is ever too big for Dane. Um, so that... I, I struggle with that because I don't think that he came out shaky. I don't think that he was nervous. He played in big games his whole life. He, I mean, there's a game on YouTube that's worth watching for people that don't know where Dane is the quarterback at Tulsa, and he goes in into Oklahoma, into Norman, Oklahoma, and he plays against Baker Mayfield, and he goes toe-for-toe toe with Baker Mayfield for three hours, and they both end up with four or five touchdowns, 300 plus yards. Like there, it's an amazing game to be able to watch. And that, that game really taught me everything I need to know about Dane. Um, and so when he stepped into the great cup, always you're going to end up having, I think some success um, when you have experience in those big moments, but he might not have been in the great cup, but I'll tell you what, like the next time he gets to a great cup with Hamilton or anybody else, he's going to be much better off for the experience he went through. Cause I believe that Boldy Von Mitchell doesn't win the Grey Cup in 2018 in Edmonton if he doesn't lose the previous two in 16-17 against the Red Blacks and the Argos. And it's just sometimes it takes some learning. And I think, you know, even recently we've seen the Last Dance documentary on ESPN and Netflix with the 90s Bulls. And it's like people forget MJ came into the league in 84. MJ didn't win until 91. Like it, it takes a while to figure that stuff out. And Dane is young and very, very talented. So He'll figure out that side of things. But, uh, yeah, I got full confidence in him that he'll be able to, to get back into that game. And he'll have a moment, you know, like a Calvillo or like any of these other quarterbacks who they look back on their failures and it makes them stronger. Hypothetically, if the CFL does start, uh, fans won't be in the stands. Uh, how would that, uh, you know, contribute to your calling? Because, you know, sometimes announcers will look for fans to help them with their calls. Yeah, I'm again, I'm pretty isolated up there, unfortunately, on the 100th uh, floor of the Trump Tower of Tim Morton's field. So it's it's uh, I don't rely on the fans as much as I think I do in some other locations like in Edmonton and in Winnipeg and in BC. We're pretty close to the fans. You kind of get a vibe for the way that things are going and, and perception and whatnot. The thing I, I'll really miss if we end up having games without fans is just the idea of having um you know, basically fan reactions and the fans' mm -hmm. excitement because I really do think that impacts the game. And it's, you know, if you've been watching any of the UFC that's happened the last week or so, it's weird. Like, it it's, is, really, yeah. it's really, really strange. And you can hear everything, which is interesting. It gives you more access. But the athletes feed off of the energy that surrounds them at all times. And does that mean that Brandon Banks is going to run slower? No. Uh, does it mean that Simone Lawrence isn't going to hit as hard? No. But it to me, it does mean that those guys are not going to feel the same at the end of the game. Like, is there's something really special for those guys? I know something psychological, you know, a hundred percent. Yeah, I, and I just know from being around them that it means something to them to finish a game, win a game at home, and go celebrate with the fans and high five the fans and sign autographs. And and I can say this from experience, being somebody who's played high school football in Kingston, Ontario, growing up. When you finish a game and there's nobody there, and you just like walk back to the locker room it doesn't feel real cool. Like you, you just kind of like walk off and you're like, Oh, that's it. Okay. Yeah. And, and then you go on with your day and we've all been there from the early days of football, but for those guys to play in that stadium that usually seats 26 to 30,000 and to have 4,000 max people in there, there's going to be no noise. There's going to be no excitement. I don't know what the game day operations clue, uh, crew is going to do for putting excitement into the stadium for the players. I just, I don't know. I don't know how any of it's going to work. And that's why it's all a great mystery. And, uh, and I, I just hope we get to find out because I hope we get a chance to be able to play some games because I, I do love watching CFL football, regardless of what's sitting outside the white lines. Major leagues such as like the NHL and NFL have toyed around with the idea for artificial uh, noise from the, for the crowd. Like what's your uh, thoughts on that? My only thing with it is like how much noise are they allowed to pump in? Because I, I do think that there's, there's a point of no return where at what point does it become then legal to be able to pump noise in when there are fans in the crowd? Like if you get 10,000 in, you can pump noise, but if you got 14,000 in, well, no noise. It's like, well, what's the difference? Does that 4,000 people really equal the sound that you can create in that environment? No. So um, I, I think that's going to be kind of like a funny subplot to this that I'm not sure uh, we truly understand yet. I think the idea of basically creating a synthetic fan environment is really useless to me. Like 
let's be real about it, right? Like I just, I came back from the grocery store a couple of minutes before we started doing the interview and like there's people in masks everywhere. And it's weird. Like I drive past the LCBO, the beer store, and there's lined up people around the block and they're all standing six feet, two meters apart. And it's like, we don't have to lie. Like we, we know what's going on. You don't have to lie to your consumers. You don't have to lie to your fans. You don't have to lie to your listeners. Everybody knows the reality of what's happening. And I think the sooner that we realize the reality and the gravity of everything that's happening, um, the sooner we'll be better off because it'll drive home the point. You know, it's, we don't need to put makeup on everything and try to make it look like, Hey, we're all happy. And we're all perfect. No, we're not happy. It's, it sucks. We haven't had sports in two months. We all love watching sports. Like I am legitimately sad without watching the Raptors. I walk the dogs every night. And after I'm done walking the dogs, I'm like, I go to my TV and I just don't turn it on. But out of habit, I grab the remote and I'm like, I should be watching the playoffs. I should be watching, <laughs> I should be watching the Leafs right now. I should be watching a baseball game on a Saturday afternoon. And I'm not. And so that's the reality. And I don't know why we would try to pretend like there's a different reality for the fans of the CFL when and if we get a chance to play. I'm sorry, but the Leafs would have been already eliminated in seven. Yeah, I know. I've lost time. I lost my track of uh, the timeline because months and days and weeks don't seem to matter. (laughs) You are absolutely right, though. Um, so, uh, oh, I just lost my uh, train of thought. Anyway, going back to the Grey Cup, uh, as most CFL fans know, uh, Andrew Harris is a beast of a running back. If you were Orlando Steinhauer, how would you defend the run against or the against the run? Yeah, I for me, uh, Andrew Harris is so good because he does a little bit of everything. He's so well rounded. There's there's been backs in the league before that are great pass catchers, and there's ones that are. Uh, very talented at being able to, you know, kind of run the rock in between the tackles, but they can't, you know, catch a swing pass to save their life, things of that nature. But he does it all well. So for me, I think you basically would have no choice but to be able to, uh, I think, probably use uh, at least two people on him, whether that's a defensive end who's spying on him or a middle linebacker who's kind of angled up on him but outside of that I mean I'm not sure what you can do that every time you give the guy the ball he's going to fall forwards and every time that there's good blocking up front he's going to get four five six yards and then he's going to bust one once in a while so um, you need really good tackling in your secondary and outside of that good luck because he's just that good yeah if I'm not mistaken you would have done player interviews since the Ticats play-by-play correct yep yep for sure uh if so with that uh who has been your favorite player that you've interviewed I lived with Mike Daly when I was in university and I've always enjoyed being able to, to talk with Mike because he's just so honest uh, and he doesn't really have a filter like some of the other guys do. But um, Dane is a great interview just because he, he has the ability to really paint the picture for you of what he saw and he doesn't mind letting you into his mind a little bit. You know, he'll say, you know, I was trying to read off the corner and then the corner drove down low and the half rotated over the top. And so I looked down at the, the X receiver and I came to the backside, but the free safety drove on that. He'll really tell you in quarterback terms to a former quarterback like myself what, what he saw, which really helps me understand his thinking process. But um, outside of that, I would say, yeah, the, those two guys are some of my favorites. Courtney Steven has always been an enjoyable conversation. Uh, Jackson Bennett is kind of a new one on the Tie Cats that is a really – introspective thoughtful guy uh, that I always like being around and on the offensive line Mike Filer is um, is somebody I've always enjoyed being around because with Mike it's not necessarily the interview but I can sit down at his locker after a game for just two minutes and ask him a couple of quick questions that are off air off Mike and he'll he'll just give you the details like he doesn't he doesn't really have any fears of um, the ways that he thinks that he should answer the question he'll just say hey here's how it is and there's nothing to hide from him so I I appreciate players that kind of let down their walls a little bit and allow us to allow us to do our jobs but also allow us to be able to give fans the real true story and I think all of those guys that I mentioned do how important is it to build that relationship off camera yeah it's big and it's also super difficult and I'm super awkward so uh it's (laughs) it's one of those things where I'd love to say that I got great relationships with absolutely everybody on the team but um, there's been times where I've written articles being critical of the team. For example, when they were 0-8, like, what am I supposed to write? Like, I, I, can't, I can't vouch for C.J. Gable when he's not blocking anybody. And I can't vouch for a right tackle that, um, you know, is a journeyman tackle that is giving up three sacks a game and then your quarterback's getting hurt. And, like, who am I supposed to blame for that? So um, I think that over time you learn how to massage those things. The, the thing I really appreciate is the athletes who know that you can't always be positive. 
And I think those are the best guys. Like Bo Levi Mitchell, I was in training camp in 2013 with the Calgary Stampeders just for an internship program. And I got to know Bo a little bit. And, and Bo, I consider him to be a friend because – even when I don't say something glowing about him, he'll discuss it with me or he'll shoot me a text and have a rebuttal to it. And he doesn't just say, well, you're a bad person. And that's the thing that I hate is we're so absolute in the way that athletes often criticize the media and vice versa. It should be a dialogue and it should be an open discussion. They're, you're allowed to have opinions. You need to back up those opinions and it needs to be with facts and with information, not with just, well, here's how I feel and I don't have anything to back it up. Um, and so those guys that are able to have the conversation about things, they're the ones that you really come to appreciate over time. And I think the Ticats have got a lot of those guys in the room. With the CFO being crushed financially by the coronavirus, how would you like for the, the league to handle the situation they're in? I think Randy Ambrose is doing as good a job as he can. Like I, I, you know, the money side of things is a little over my head, but He's going about it the way that he should. I think he's being contrite. I think that he's asking the right people. He's asking the people that have the money. Uh, and I think that all that they can do at this point, it's, it's kind of the sad reality that I've come to when I'm doing my morning show in health. And we talk about all the different sports, NHL, NBA, otherwise. And I just, for me, I keep coming back to the fact that like, a league can do everything perfectly. It can take every possible step to get this all correct. And it can still get screwed. Like that's the reality of a pandemic is it, it doesn't matter sometimes how many safeguards you had in or what you had built up. Uh, and I think for the CFL, they've taken a lot of positive steps. I think they're learning a lot on the fly as they go through. I'm sure every day is an adventure in terms of the hoops they're trying to jump through to make this become a reality. But um, as long as they are putting the effort in and they're learning and they're being honest and they're asking the right people for assistance, uh, I think that's really all you can ask for at this point. Do you think that there could be any other methods the CFO would be able to generate more revenue? I'm, I'm kind of intrigued by the idea of people buying cardboard cutouts of themselves to put in the stands. I've seen that on Twitter uh, over in Germany for the Bundesliga. I believe they're doing that. And I think in the Korean baseball league as well, where people can pay 20 bucks and then it's them at the game and they can see themselves at the game. And it's dorky and it's strange. And it's, but again, all of this is creating a dorky, strange environment that we all have to kind of power through, right? So um, I think that's an intriguing one. I don't know what use that would be in the Canadian Football League, but I know there's a lot of people who go to the Grey Cup every year who, if given the opportunity to pay 50 bucks and put a, you know, a, car, a stand up in the crowd and that money goes to uh, personal protective equipment for nurses or goes to the Canadian Food Bank or um, then they would absolutely be interested in being able to do that, I think, with a, with a little bit of the proceeds going to the league to help keep it kind of stay up on its feet. But that's that's the one that I've kind of I've laughed at because it's silly and it's weird, but it's also a possibility. And I think anything that's a possibility to help at this point is probably a good thing. With the CFL uh, draft happening just, uh, I think, like a few days or a few weeks ago, are you able to are you able to provide any insight to Hamilton Tiger Cat fans on the draft picks? Yeah, I, uh, I studied the draft pretty closely for CFL.ca. So um, Coulter Woodmancy is a big body offensive lineman that will probably slot in as a guard, but he's got kind of tackle flexibility. And I think uh, he was, when I watched his game film from being at the University of Guelph, uh, he was just always under control, but he played with a lot of power. And I love that about what he did. His footwork was really sound. And when he got his hands on you, he just, he, he could drive you back. It's pretty simple and straightforward with him. There's not a lot of, nuance to his offensive line plays just very sound very solid very fundamentally well taught and you could see that from watching his games uh outside of that mason bennett was their second first round pick he's a really talented edge defender he's really the only true defensive end i think that was in this draft class that's like not going to be asked to play special teams in one night he's like six four two sixty something like that uh and yeah he's and he's long and he's really strong and he's got great lower body strength and He's not the fastest guy in the world off the ball, and he doesn't have the greatest, you know, spin move or crazy dynamic pass rush. But in terms of a Canadian body that you could put in a CFL uniform tomorrow and trust them to get on the field and, and rush the passer, he was it. So outside of that, Tyler Chernowski, good, shifty, small slot back out of Waterloo. They got uh, themselves a little bit of offensive line depth as well. And, and I felt like overall they did a really good job of basically determining their needs and then, you know, figuring it out really quickly and just going to work and, and finding solutions for their roster and the spots that they had holes. What does it mean for you being a part of the Ticats for so long to read the announcement that Hamilton is getting a Grey Cup game? 
Yeah, that was pretty cool. I was at the Great Cup announcement uh, at Tim Hortons Field the night that it got announced, and we all knew that they were going to get announced. We just weren't sure if it was going to be 2020 or 2021, which now looks pretty sweet that they got 2021. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. But, yeah, to be able to have that, it'll be huge for the city. Since I've been here in Hamilton since 2010 when I moved from Kingston to to play football at McMaster, that's always been the talk is when they were getting one. And I've I've been to every Great Cup since 2015, so it's been – you know, Winnipeg and then uh, Toronto and Ottawa and then Edmonton and then Calgary. And uh, each Grey Cup takes on its own personality. And I, I'm just really excited to see what Hamilton's personality is for a Grey Cup because I've never experienced it. And it's been a long, long time since people have been able to show how good Hamilton is at hosting that event. How far away is the CFL from uh, make or putting a team in Halifax? I actually, I doubt it'll happen at this point, uh, just because of everything that's going on. You can't go to the federal government and ask for money and then go spend money on a new team. Um, I just don't think it makes sense. For right now, I think it's got to be put on the back burner for probably five, ten years again. It's unfortunate, but it's not that dissimilar to the XFL kicking off their second incarnation and then a pandemic slaps them in the face and all of a sudden they disappear, right? So um, I think it's unfortunate. Halifax deserves a team but I just don't think that it's feasible right now based on the finances that we're all talking about and, and asking the government for money and then going out spending money on something that you're not asking money for is a really bad look that might actually result in you not getting any funding. Do you have any worries that the CFO might disappear in the near future? I think it's always a risk when you go through something like this. Um, because if you can't sustain yourself, then, you know, what are you to do? I think that there's, there's a conversation to be had there. For me, I have a great amount of trust in the fact that the people that are in charge, whether it be the finances, football operations, otherwise, they, this league is always sustained and it's sustained because um, they know when to be daring and they know when to be smart. And I think right now is a time to be smart. And I think you'll see a very conservative approach moving forward on um, how to operate the Canadian football league. And I, that, that will probably be the key to help, keeping this thing alive regardless of whether or not government funding comes through and if it does you know get shut down well not for a year two years cease operations it'll be back it'll always be back because there's always going to be interest and there's always going to be a belief in in the strength of the league and uh, in its ability to unite Canadians. Last question here Uh, do you have any advice for aspiring journalists? Yeah my my way that I really found out who I was and what helped me get involved uh, in, in different things I was really passionate about was figuring out kind of what the niche is. Like, where's the, where's the spot where you can create your own space is the thing that I always kind of lean back on. Because for me, that was Canadian football. And it might seem, you know, like, okay, well, I love Canadian football. I can just do that too. But you really got to gotta find a way to, to differentiate, differentiate yourself and make yourself unique. And I think for me, that was just being able to combine um, the knowledge of playing the sport along with really just being a nerd, just enjoying reading about it, watching stuff, having a historical database in my head. And, um, you know, sometimes you got to combine all of that with just charisma and just having fun and being able to, there's a lot of different ways to get involved in sports broadcasting. There's from journalism and being really good at writing to being able to uh, ramble forever like I can do on radio because that's what I've always done to being able to paint a picture for people with play-by-play to being an excellent color analyst. I mean, there's just, that's the fun thing about broadcasting is there's so many different ways to get involved and that's just on mic, right? There's so many different jobs behind the scenes that are really, really rewarding and really fun as well to do that. Hey, they pay you a check and you get to go home, you get to eat food and go out on dinners and, all the rest. So, um, yeah, I just find something unique that you really, really find joy in and then just work really hard at it because honestly, that's all I've done. And, uh, it's worked out better than I think I could have imagined at this point, which I've, uh, I've enjoyed a lot. Do you use, uh, knowledge from your playing career to help you with, uh, broadcasting? Yeah, I think I try to limit it because I realize that playing youth sports football is not the same as playing in the CFL. And you don't want to disrespect the guys that are playing professionally by saying, well, everything that I do is the same as you because it's not. And I know that it's not. But uh, I do think that there's there's some commonalities there. And you can understand that as grand as professional football seems, there's a lot of moments where they're just the same as we are. They're just they're humans. They're exceptionally more talented humans who have more intricacies to what they do on X's and O's and all the rest, but um, they're just guys playing a game and you got to kind of boil it down to that simple fact sometimes. And that really helps guide 
I think the way that you uh, you can cover the game is because you can realize that they're they're human and they care about what they do, which uh, I think a lot of us can relate to in our own work. Is it hard to paint a picture while doing radio? No, I think it's a developing skill. You get used to it. Um, it, it. The hardest thing I would say is being able to keep the listener informed on radio play-by-play -play because you constantly got to tell them down, distance, hash, substitution package, who's in, where they are on the field, here's the snap, and then describe the action using adjectives that are just Masoli throws, Banks catches, right? You got to find ways to be able to give people information. So, But that's something that comes with time. And it's that's why anytime you're given the ability to learn and to get opportunities that are live, like really on the fly, like I was, you're going to become better and you're going to learn from that. And, uh, and I'm, that's why I'm thankful I got given the chance because I wouldn't be the broadcaster I am today if I hadn't been given the chance to figure it out and learn. And, uh, and I think that that's where you figure out how to paint the picture and how to relay that information in a way that uh, keeps people interested in what you're doing. All right. Well, that'll do it here on today's edition of the podcast. I'd like to thank Marshall Ferguson again for joining me. Thank you, Michael. Awesome. Have a good day. Awesome. Thanks, brother.